It's our sweetest guilty pleasure. So appealing, Americans spend more than $25 billion a year to experience it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Extruded, kneaded, injected, and spun. All to satisfy our sweet tooth. Where else can you get this much fun in a box for a quarter? You'll be shocked to learn how little sugar is in cotton candy and discover what substance puts the polish on Mike and Ike's. Ever wonder how this familiar mint gets its trademark pattern? Or what special ingredient makes a lemon head so sour? It's an art form. Come on, indulge yourself with more candy on Modern Marvels. Candy. The mere mention of the word can make your mouth water. I like the green one. I like the green one. Americans savor seven billion pounds of these sweet treats each year. Face it, candy brings out the kid in all of us, and we never outgrow our magnificent obsession. No one knows this better than Gino and Nick Marini owners of Marini's Candies that began as a popcorn stand on the boardwalk in Santa Cruz, California. The brothers are fourth generation candy men, preserving the legacy begun by their great grandfather a century ago. Like many innovators in the industry, they're redefining the limits of candy making with sugary concoctions that dare to be different. Case in point, chocolate covered bacon. My cousin decided, you know, we all love bacon. Let's go ahead and dip some of it in chocolate. Couldn't, you know, couldn't be a bad idea, and it, and it worked out. We've been making the bacon uh, for about three years now, and it really has taken off. Now, the funniest part is when we see people come in, and they're like, chocolate-covered bacon? What's this chocolate bacon like? Can I try some of that? And then you say, yeah, you, you know, you got to taste it to believe it. And then you see the look on their face when they actually taste it, and they're like, wow, that's really good. Marini's chocolate-covered bacon has become so popular that Gino and Nick dip and ship an average of 30 pounds each day. You like bacon? That's really good. Dipping chocolate in bacon may seem simple, but the process of making it involves some exacting steps. Each day, the brothers cook up to 40 pounds of premium center-cut hickory smoked bacon. Two pounds at a time. They don't fry it fast in a pan, but slow cook it in an oven for 35 minutes. This ensures the bacon will lose most of its grease and gristle. According to the Marinis, that's the key to producing the most flavor and crunch. So now we've got a, oh, that's really hot. We're gonna take it and just put it on to the paper towels here. Just get it nice and crispy. And the longer it dries, the more crispy it'll get. So that's basically what we're looking for right there. Um, nice crispy piece. It snaps apart when you break it. That's pretty good stuff right there. The bacon must cool to room temperature before it heads into the dipping room to get its sweet chocolate shell. If the bacon's too warm, the chocolate won't set. Too cold, and its fat juices will coagulate, making the final product greasy. The chocolate requires specific temperature conditions too. This is a temperature controlled room. We keep the chocolates at about 102 to 103 degrees at all time. Can't dip chocolate at that temperature. We need to get the chocolate down onto the marble surface, temper it, get it to room temperature. This heating and cooling process, called tempering, is the key to making the surface of the chocolate smooth and shiny. If you try to dip with chocolate that's above room temperature, when it dries, it leaves a white film that definitely doesn't look very appetizing. The bacon sits on drying racks for just 15 minutes. Then, it goes straight to the watering mouths of its fans. Oh my god, that's really good. 
But bacon isn't the only unusual treat the Marinis love to dip in chocolate. We've tried dipping just about anything, from insects to dried fruits to, I mean, we'll put anything in chocolate and give it a taste. But over the last four or five years, the salty and sweet has been pretty popular. We take a ruffled salted potato chip and dip that in chocolate. You'd be surprised at the number of people we have come in who buy the chips and the bacon at the same time. Oh, it's delicious. Thank you. In increasing numbers, candy makers are embracing the combination of the sweet and the salty. And with good reason. Our taste buds actually respond well to the mixture. You've got an average of 9,000 taste buds on your tongue inside mushroom-shaped openings called fungiform papillae. When you take a bite of chocolate-covered bacon, its chemicals fall into the papillae, where your taste buds translate the chemical signals into electrical signals to your brain. The sweet chocolate and salty bacon combine to send an unusually savory message. All of the nerves that are sending messages to the brain actually work together. So one receptor will enhance the function of another. The receptor that's involved with sweet kind of makes the nerves that are sensitive to salt a little more active. The end result is that the two uh, go very well together. One candy maker's sweet and salty recipes have attracted the taste buds of America's number one couple. President Barack Obama and his First Lady Michelle. Meet celebrated confectioner, Fran Bigelow. His particular favorite was the smoked sea salt caramel, and then Michelle the gray sea salt caramel and the dark chocolate. We continue to supply the Oval Office with chocolates. We've made a presidential box for them, and they'll hand that out. It's just, it's been very exciting. Fran's Chocolates in Seattle, Washington handcrafts chocolate-covered caramels sprinkled with sea salt. To perfect her sweet and salty specialty, Fran spent years searching for varieties of salt with just the right flavor profile. She discovered that gray sea salt, harvested off the coast of Brittany in France, complemented dark chocolate impeccably. And oak-smoked salt from Wales is a perfect partner for milk chocolate the smoked sea salt is softer and sweeter, so it doesn't overpower the milk chocolate. It's sort of seamless and just a wonderful combination with it. With the dark chocolate, we need something just a little more assertive, so it perks up your taste buds and, and stands up to that caramel. At her family-run kitchen facility, Fran makes between 14,000 and 18,000 caramels a day. That's about 325 pounds. Like many confections, caramel is made primarily of sugar. And step one is to melt it. It all starts by heating 30 pounds of organic raw sugar in a copper pot. We use copper because it conducts heat so well. Trying to completely melt the sugar so it doesn't have any other sugar crystals left in it. So we will stay here until it is completely melted and let it just get really, really dark, caramely, almost burnt to give it that wonderful, wonderful flavor. When the sugar is completely melted, the caramel makers pour it into a 20 pound mixture of caramel's other key ingredients. Cream, lemon juice, and butter. The concoction then cooks for 45 minutes. You don't want the caramel ever to lose the boil. See, as you're adding ingredients to it, because we're trying to also evaporate the moisture out of this caramel to get it to a point where you can pick it up and you can dip it in chocolate. The boiling process removes virtually all the water from the mixture, resulting in a syrupy form of the chewy confection. It's then poured into custom molds. After setting for 24 hours, the finished caramels are ready to take a ride under a chocolate waterfall. Fran's chocolate, just like that of the Marini brothers, has undergone the tempering process that ensures a flawless shell that tastes as good as it looks. The 
chocolate has been heated and then cooled so that the cocoa butter crystals are all in alignment and that they will provide you with the perfect texture in your mouth. As scrumptious as these chocolate caramels are at this point, it's the sprinkle of salt that sets them apart. What we found is once we added that little bit of sprinkle of salt on the top, it just opened up the flavor in your mouth. And we went, wow, this is it. Oh my god. That's the wow that tickles the taste buds of the Obamas and countless other fans of Fran's caramels. Well, I got the advice from a friend of mine to always eat it upside down. So you get the salt mixed first, and that's like a good tip. And ever since then, it's a really wonderful combination. Another type of candy not only satisfies your sweet tooth, but also freshens your breath. Or does it? This factory in Chicago turns out the number one selling hard candy in the United States. Any guesses what it is? Here's a hint. You'll encounter it most often on top of your restaurant check or your hotel pillow. Say hello to the Peppermint Starlight Mint, made by Primrose Candy. Every year, Americans pop 36 million of these iconic favorites into their mouths for a sweet rush and fresher breath. That fresh feeling comes from peppermint's main active ingredient, menthol. Menthol, which is in peppermint, is a very interesting compound because it has two effects. One is obviously to clean up and make your mouth feel fresh after the meal. But the other thing is, it actually acts on the GI tract, on your gut, to move things along so your stomach empties a little more quickly and so you don't feel quite so full and uncomfortable. The first step in the recipe is to cook a mixture of sugar and corn syrup. We cook it to 300 degrees to get all that water out. Now, it looks like it's actually very fluid at this point in time, like there is water in it. But right now, that is 98% solid. And the only reason why it's fluid is because it's at 260 degrees. After the mixture is fully cooked, workers add the all-important peppermint. It's so potent that all it takes is a couple of teaspoons, representing just two-tenths of 1% of the final product. We use a natural peppermint oil that actually adds the mint flavor. The sugar and the corn syrup add the sweetness to it, which makes it what you really like, because peppermint oil is way too strong to have without the candy base. After the liquidy syrup cooks for five minutes, workers pour it onto a cooling table. Within 10 minutes, this 140-pound mass of goo will be transformed into 10,000 finished mints. This table has chilled water running through it. The chilled water then uh, keeps the surface cool, and it will cool the candy. The candy right now, as you see, is far too lucid to be put in the machine. It needs to be in a plastic state. As soon as the candy firms up a bit, mechanical arms knead it into a taffy-like consistency. Then workers transfer the gooey mass to the molding table. Here, the real fun begins. A red batch of candy cooked and mixed on the other side of the kitchen joins the white candy mass. Then, like kids playing with Play-Doh, they roll both red and white sections into long strips. Right now, they're making the stripe for the Starlight Mint. What we did is we took one stripe, stretched it out the length of the table, and then cut it in half to make two stripes. Then we took the two stripes, stretched it out the length of the table to make four stripes. And then when we got the four stripes, we stretched it out the length of the table and cut it in threes to make the 12 stripes. And the 12 stripes is the jacket, which he's now putting together. The jacket basically makes up about 30% of the Starlight Mint, and the center makes up 70%. And then we're going to roll the body into the jacket 
and make one big, massive, almost like a candy cane without the bend. The trick now is to thin this five foot long, two foot wide candy burrito into a strip with a diameter of less than an inch. An extruding machine handles that challenge, rolling and stretching the mass down to a width the size of the final mint. Finally, razor sharp blades form the finished mints. 110 at a time. They taste as good as they look, but are they really any match for chronic bad breath? It's actually a mask. These mints, the menthol in it volatilizes very easily. What I mean by volatilize is that it becomes like a gas. In other words, the molecules, the menthol spreads in the air, and you have the impression that you have actually cleaned up your bad smells here. Experts say the most effective countermeasure to bad breath is proper dental hygiene. But mints can augment good brushing and flossing habits as a quick fix when we need it. Some candies combine that quick fix with a sweet taste of chocolate, like the number one selling after dinner mint, Andy's Creme de Menthe. 10 million of the three-layered green foil wrapped candies are made every day at this factory in Delavan, Wisconsin. There's a surprising backstory to the familiar mountain logo and the mint's name. It dates back to 1920 and the candy maker that created it, Andrew Canellos. At first, these box chocolates were called Andes because the name of the inventor was Andrew. But some people wouldn't like to give their girlfriends or their wives a box of chocolates with another man's name. And so they came up with the name Andes, but spelt it A-N-D-E-S after the Andes Mountains in South America. Many details of the Andes production process have been tightly guarded secrets for decades. Secrets now held by Tootsie Roll Industries. The recipe for the Andes creme de menthe thins has remained the same since they were first introduced in 1950, and it is top secret. Even so, Andes clued us in on a few facts. The chocolate portion of the candy is made by machines that grind cocoa powder and sugar against each other to create an extremely fine mixture. Each particle is only 26 microns in diameter, or about a thousandth of an inch. That's about half the width of a single human hair. This is the powdered product that comes off of the finished refiner. And we want this product to be uh, this fine so that you have that smooth chocolate feel in your mouth. So we taste it to determine if it meets our flavor profile. And we rub it on our bottom lip as a double check for the particle size reduction to make sure that it's as smooth as we expect it to be at this point. Conveyors carry the fine granules to a large blender called a conch. Oil and butter are added and the conch mixes them for five hours. The result is liquid chocolate. It's the mint portion of the candy, however, that makes Andy's such a popular favorite. But how it becomes part of the finished product is the big secret its makers keep safely locked away. All we can say is that it consists of a blend of peppermint oils that gives each triple-layered candy its signature fresh kick. That also applies for a variation of the original candy, called Andy's Creme de Menthe Parfait, which inverts the green portion that's normally in the middle into the two outside layers. Andy's isn't the only popular candy that has a name with a colorful history. And it's at the center of an unsolved mystery. Who exactly were the enigmatic Mike and Ike? 
Going to the movies just isn't the same without something sweet to munch on. And your local Cineplex couldn't survive if you weren't hooked. Candy and concession sales are the lifeblood of the theater business, accounting for 40% of profits. One candy contributing to that windfall is Dots, the number one selling gumdrop brand in the United States. These colorful treats have plenty of colorful secrets. Starting with the enormous facility where they're made. The building was originally built during World War II, and it was built to manufacture Chrysler engines for B-29 bombers. Later, Maverick automaker Preston Tucker took over the factory, producing the 50 cars bearing his name that became prized collector's items. Now, it's dots rolling off the assembly line here. A staggering 24 million individual pieces every day. They're made from 136,000 pounds of gooey sweetness that's cooked 600 gallons at a time. Dots are made by mixing ingredients of sugar, corn syrup, water, and starch. It makes a 6,000 pound batch of dots. And we make about 30,000 pounds of dots a day. Starch is what gives dots their characteristic thick, gummy texture. When it's finished cooking along with all the other ingredients, the mixture flows into six tanks that produce six distinct colors and flavors simultaneously. Workers add one liquid containing an artificial color, a second an artificial flavor. They're meticulous about matching their combos, so your yellow dot tastes like a lemon and not a cherry. The challenge of forming the dot's shape starts with this machine, the Mogul. It makes a custom mold by filling these trays with starch, the same substance that's in the dots themselves. And dyes come down and make holes in the starch. And then the liquid formula is poured into these holes to form the shape of the dots. This starch mold, unlike one made from metal, prevents the candy from sticking and enables easier removal and handling. 28 trays are filled every minute, creating more than 1.7 million dots every hour. The starch mold is still hot at this point at about 24% moisture. The dots are very liquid and still hot and oozy. You actually pick them up and you can smear them and then eventually we dry this down but right now it's a very liquid, molten material. The dots dry over the next 24 hours as the starch mold absorbs moisture, ensuring the desired final texture. After that curing time, we actually turn these trays over and these dots go on for further processing. And the dots head off for their final treatment, polishing. That's the job of this machine. It looks like it was designed by Willy Wonka, called the Z-Blender. The dots, when they go into the Z-Blender, have a little bit of starch residue on them, which makes them a little bit dull. And the Z-Blender removes the starch and puts a shine on them, and the shine is what gives them the fresh dot appearance. As popular as dots are with moviegoers, they're not the only chewy candies vying for top billing. Mike and Ike has been a blockbuster hit with candy lovers since 1940. The sweet with a chewy center and a hard candy shell was the brainchild of Just Born, a family-owned company owned by Russian immigrant Sam Born. He opened up a little shop in Brooklyn, New York, and used to put a sign in a window that read, uh, if the candy's so fresh, it's as if it was just born that day. And it was a play on the name, and the name stuck. But the story of how Mike and Ike Candy got its name is one of the candy world's great unsolved mysteries. Who were Mike and Ike? Don't ask the folks at Just Born. Even they don't know. There's a lot of mystery surrounding how the name Mike and Ike came to be. Uh, we do know a couple of things. Uh, Mike and Ike were popular names back then. There was President Ike Eisenhower. 
There was a vaudeville act named Mike and Ike. And we think for all of these reasons, somehow the name Mike and Ike came to be. Today's fans of Mike and Ike care a lot more about what the candy tastes like than the origins of its name. That's their candy. At its factory in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, Just Born produces as many as 70 million individual pieces of Mike and Ike per day. That's a mind-blowing 25 billion a year, or enough to fill 500 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Not surprisingly, the main ingredients for Mike and Ike's are the same as those for many other candies. Sugar, corn syrup, and starch. And the familiar mogul machine makes starch molds that form the chewy centers. Once the centers come out of the mogul, they come up to this area where they're cooled. Once cooled, they'll go into trays like you see beside me. At this point, the center is flavorless and ready to go to the flavoring area, but it still tastes pretty good. It's very sweet. Here's the place where Mike and Ike's find their flavor, at a station that looks more like a laundromat than a candy factory. The rotating containers perform a process called cold panning. Inside each container are the flavorless chewy centers, to which workers add sugar, syrup, and the all-important color and flavors. The pan's rotating motion causes a colorful, sugary shell to accumulate around each soft center. They'll go through a multi-step process of adding various ingredients to build that flavor coating onto the Mike and Ike Center. It's not even an, a, a science per se, it's, a, it's an art form, and it's something that not everybody can do in watching the product as it's being flavored so that they can make adjustments, add different ingredients at different times, depending on how the product is reacting. The flavors added during this artful process range from newer entries like Caribbean punch to traditional standbys like cherry, lemon, lime, and orange. Orange Mike and Ike, the original. Each piece is polished with carnauba wax, derived from the leaves of Brazilian palm trees. The wax is commonly used in the candy industry to polish all sorts of treats and as a coating for dental floss. Now at this point you can see that the candy still has a powdery finish to it. So what we do behind me is we polish the candy. The polishing not only gives the center a nice shiny look, but it also helps to protect the candy. It keeps moisture from getting into the candy to make it soft, and it keeps moisture from getting out of the candy to make it hard. The polished product sets for four hours before heading to packaging. Candy with the mysterious name is ready for the movie theater. There's no mystery about the name of this popular candy. But few know the identity of the ingredient that gives it its super sour punch. They're only the size of peas. But don't let these little yellow candies fool you. Both soft and hard, sweet and sour, Lemonheads prove that big flavor can come in small packages. They've been making our lips pucker with pleasure since 1962. The interesting thing about the Lemonhead is its lemon shock appeal. Here is this perfectly smooth, clean, yellow candy. You are not expecting this sort of pow from that small a piece of candy. The pow flavor from candy like Lemonheads comes from their sourness. The sensation when it strikes is unmistakable. When you eat something super sour, the message gets to the brain that it's sour, and you get a message back that says, oh my goodness, it's sour, we have to dilute this. So you produce an enormous quantity of saliva. You know, sometimes it even hurts when it's trying to come out so fast. Puckering in response to overly sour taste is a defense mechanism. When you pucker, you squeeze your salivary glands to create additional moisture in your mouth. 
diluting the sour candy to make it more tolerable. As you age, your sensitivity to sour taste diminishes, since your number of taste buds can reduce by as much as 50%. That's what he said this morning. So why is it that kids, those with the most taste buds of all, are more drawn to sweet and sour candies? You can hold them. Kids love to suck on lemons, and they love sour candies. And you scratch your head now, they've got more taste endings, right? But the fact of the matter is that they also are more sensitive to sweet as well as sour. So for them, they can kind of balance it out. So neither the sour nor the sweet are terribly strong. No matter how old you taste buds, you'll get a mouthful of flavor from just one lemon head. The Ferrera Pan Candy Company cranks out more than 500 million lemon heads every year. That's about 80 pieces each second. Making them requires a combination of hard and soft candy manufacturing techniques. That's because each lemon head is part hard candy center and part soft sugary shell. Creating the hard candy center resembles the process for making a starlight mint. The bulk of the mixture is sugar and corn syrup. After the mixture is cooked, cooled, and kneaded, fifty pound pieces are tossed into an extruder. It rolls and pulls them into a long sheet about a foot wide and a quarter of an inch thick. The sheet passes between these rollers, where the pattern for every spherical center is impressed, creating a matrix holding them all in place. It will come out in sheet and it will fall into the breakup drum. It's cascading into the breakup drum, tumbling, and it's falling into the tray. Now the hard, sour centers of the lemonheads need their soft, sweet shells. They get them at the cold panning station, and the same process used to coat Mike and Ike candy. The first step adds a sticky mixture of sugar and corn syrup that adheres to the hard centers as they tumble. In this step, Martin's adding the color to our corn syrup and sugar mix. He will mix it in, stir it, and use that as the glue for the panning process. This is enough to handle all 10 pans of candy. Next, sugar adds bulk and sweetness to each center. Ferrara Pan goes through 200,000 pounds of sugar each day. At just the right moment, it's time to add the lemon head's signature ingredient, a lemon concentrate that gives each candy its super sour punch. When Martin added the lemon flavor, we were standing behind him several feet and it was enough of uh, intensity to cause everyone around to tear up. So the flavor that we're putting on is a three-fold lemon. It's a very concentrated lemon. It's put on that way for intense flavor impact. After 45 minutes of spinning, the coated balls double in size. All that's left is a polishing treatment for that good old carnauba wax. These are lemon heads before polishing. This is lemon heads after polishing. Then they're finally off to packaging and ready for the customer. Where else can you get this much fun in a box for a quarter? The exceptionally sweet and sour final product has become so popular that Ferrara Pan also offers it in apple orange, cherry, and grape flavors. But if you're looking for a candy that delivers a party in your mouth, worthy of a carnival or theme park, this fluffy favorite from the 19th century is the only way to go. And you won't believe how little sugar it takes to create it. The Italians call it 
zucchero filato, meaning sugar thread. The French, la barbe à papa, or papa's beard. The Dutch, sukerspin, literally sugar spider. By any name, cotton candy is unique. No other sweet treat looks like a giant pastel cotton ball. It reminds us of a simpler era, when our parents and their parents enjoyed the very same taste at bygone carnivals and county fairs. Part of the fun of cotton candy is watching the candy man make it. And Nick Marini, our confectioner in Santa Cruz, California, has just as much fun putting on the show. This is our uh, cotton candy center, as you can see here. I'll go ahead and get it started up. As the sugar in the spinning cylinder melts into a sticky syrup, it's flung out through tiny holes. In the cool air, it solidifies into strands and accumulates along the machine's inner walls. Well, you want to use a bottler sugar. It's a little bit finer, so the melting process happens a little better. So the trick is when you're spinning, is to keep it spinning and not let it hit the head of the machine because the head will cut right into the cotton candy. And then when you get the size you desire, you can turn the heat off. And a couple more spins, and there you have it. The cotton candy we know today was unveiled at the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis. It was called Fairy Floss. A few decades later, it was renamed Cotton Candy. And the rest is sweet history. It remains a popular favorite at fairs, carnivals, and theme parks to this day. But it's also mass produced by facilities like Charms Company in Covington, Tennessee, the largest maker of cotton candy in the United States. Once you get started, it's hard to stop. Every batch here consists only of sugar and artificial coloring and flavor. The industrial spinning process works largely the same as the one Nick Marini uses in his candy shop. The spinner is turning at about 4,000 RPMs at a temperature above 300 degrees. The fluff accumulates on the bowl, comes out by conveyor to the bagger. We weigh it and put it in a bag, seal it up. Since cotton candy is virtually all sugar, you might think it's way too much of a good thing. But an average serving contains less sugar than a can of soda. That's because there's a lot of air in all that fluff, and only about 35 grams of sugar. It's a no-brainer that this delicate treat could be ruined by too much heat or humidity. That's usually not an issue when you buy cotton candy at a carnival, because you eat it immediately after it's made. But at Charms, it needs an ideal environment to endure long enough to reach the consumer intact. The plant's designers licked that problem with a tailor-made air conditioning system that rigidly maintains a temperature of 72 degrees Fahrenheit and 28% humidity. We installed state-of-the-art air conditioning system. We have about 250 tons of cooling. And just to give you an idea of comparison, typical house is around five tons. So in the hottest part of the day, we can remove somewhere around 1,000 gallons of water from the air. The moisture-resistant Mylar bags Charms uses for packaging also keep the cotton candy fluffy and fresh. Its estimated shelf life? 18 months. Not so long ago, you could only buy fluffy stuff and almost any other candy at your local retailer. But now you can purchase all the sweets you want online. Thanks to cyber candy shops, like the Candy Warehouse. One click of your mouse sets things in motion at its storage and shipping facility in El Segundo, California. In this confectionery palace, workers dubbed Candy Elves ship more than 3,000 varieties of sweets. This warehouse is 35,000 square feet packed full of sugary goodness. Two million pounds are in stock at any given day. 
in our warehouse. We get our candy from manufacturers all over the world, including Asia, South America, Europe. So for instance, we get Italian jujubes, we have French chocolate truffles, German gummy bears. Every conceivable candy seems to be on hand here, from the familiar to the obscure, minty to sour, tiny to giant sized, liquid to chunky, and gourmet to grotesque. They've got it all. We have some very bizarre candies here at Candy Warehouse. We've got everything from gummy boogers, which are just, they start off sweet, and then they're a little bit salty, just like a real booger, but I wouldn't know that. And then we have candy urine, too. It's a yellow, sour liquid candy that is actually quite delicious. And then we have uh, candy blood bags. They are red liquid blood that tastes really good, but it just looks like real blood. So that's a good one for Halloween parties. A lot of times people will come to our website and say, wow, I haven't seen that since I was in the fifth grade. How did you get it? And quite frankly, a lot of the manufacturers are still around, um, but they might be smaller family-owned businesses that are not going to carry at the chain stores. But uh, because we focus just on candy, we'll make sure to carry that item. The candy elves fill upwards of 800 orders a day, depending on the season. In a year, they'll ship more than 1.8 million pounds of candy around the world. And their website helps ensure that temperature-sensitive orders won't melt on the way. We actually develop software so that if you are in Chicago and it's 95 degrees, our website can tell that it is going to be 95 degrees in two days and will actually not let you ship ground. As cyber retailers are revolutionizing candy's future, they also remind us that candy takes countless forms, each the product of imagination and engineering. There's innovation, hard work, and history in every bite.